Your health is the most important thing you can invest in. Good morning, guys. This is Dr. Brendan Cochran from Interactive Health Clinic. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. I wanted to give you some updates of our proactive health strategies. And remember, knowing knowledge is power and understanding how to support yourself and protect yourself is truly proactive health. So uh, if you didn't get a chance to watch the Friday video, Friday I kind of went off on a hot topic, things that I didn't think were very right that the federal government's currently doing. Uh, we're trying to push some pressure on them because of what they're doing during these times. So look at that video if you haven't had a chance. So today I want to talk about a few things that are coming up. One is about specifically testing. And we've seen a few groups now down in California specifically come out and say that, hey, we, we've tested a bunch of people and this is really no worse than the flu for case mortality rate. We need to get back to work. We need everybody not to panic. And these came from some physicians. And one of the things I, I really do enjoy that we are doing this testing, but one of the things that I'm going to critique specifically this one center was doing testing. They did not tell us what kind of kits they used. As we know, some of the kits that are rapid tests that just say IgG, IgM, actually have a lot of false readings with them. So we are getting false positives when we shouldn't be getting false positives, which is very, very concerning. And some of these kits that are being used in those studies have come under a lot of criticism because they're coming out of China, which we know have a lot of faulty kits. We saw this with the report from the United Kingdom, where they had like something like 500,000 or 400,000 kits that they had to not use because they were faulty. And so that, that's a concern of mine. The other concern of mine, which hasn't been addressed yet, because remember, any lab test has inevitably error. It's just how can we minimize that error as small as possible? And I think some of the news you've been reading about, hey, antibody tests are right around, you know, are here, we have them, we're moving forward. And one of the things I want you to think about is because we've had patients reach out and say, oh, you guys have these. Well, yes and no. You know, one of the things is priorities going to frontline health workers or people that are exposed a lot. Two, we just we don't have as many as they'd like you to think on the news. And some of these are only doing partial testing versus the full picture. Partial testing meaning they're just testing for IgG. And if you listen to me in some of my past videos, I said testing for IgM and IgG, I think we're going to miss a lot because I personally and some of my colleagues have seen positive PCR, which is highly sensitive, and this picture of negative IgM, positive IgG, and then a few positives on their IgA, which would correlate with their positive uh, nasal swab. But one of the concerns I have of why we may be getting so many positives, and companies have said, hey, yes, we, we've tested all this, we know that it's not cross-reacting, is remember we have other coronaviruses. Coronaviruses commonly cause the cold the common cold. So how many of these kits are falsely positively reacting to the common cold? Um, that is a concern of mine. So one of the test kits I talked about in my other videos, I really like because they do IgG, IgM, and IgA, and they're doing it to four different components of this specific virus. So that way we know if you have S1, we know if you have S2, we know if you have nuclear portions of this. We know if you have the envelope. We know if you're having all that information, which for me, it makes me feel a lot more comfortable that we're not just getting one piece that may be exactly or very similar to the common cold. So I get a more comprehensive picture with that specific type of testing. Um, and, and I think that we need to look at that and we need to highly consider that to improve our actual outcomes. And the unfortunate thing is, Right now, the companies that are doing that type of testing are not considered FDA approved, even though they had their tests out long before the FDA did. 
uh, approve any of the tests. And they have been providing very high quality testing information for years. Uh, so just because it has FDA approval does not mean it's the best. You probably saw that in some of my other videos that I really don't agree with what they're doing uh, in mo multiple areas. I don't think they're in the vested interest of protecting people. Um, and I think that this is just a, a way to get things out, which I understand. However, I don't think that they're the best kits that we're pumping out. And then, of course, they're the ones your insurance cover, which then goes back to your insurance is kind of following what everybody else is following. It's like this, this herd that we're all following each other. And I like to break the herd because you get better results when you don't follow the sheep that are jumping off the cliff, obviously. So that is one of the things that I'm really concerned about is the test kits. And I'll share an article down here that shows you about those test kits. And it really, really is important to get a very big answer of what's going on here. Because some people are coming out and saying, well, the death rate is really, really low. It's like the flu. We shouldn't be worried. We should open things up. And if the test kits are faulty or have errors where sensitivity or specificity is not that great, that changes those results. So we really need to know before we go full steam ahead. Now, let me explain what that means. Now, some of the results that we're seeing in the news is suggesting, again, 0.4% uh, fatality rate, et cetera. And let me explain some things that are getting confused there. This no worse than the flu thing. Well, there's something called uh, CFR, which is casual fatality ratio. And then there's something called IFR or infected rate uh, fatality ratio or infected fatality ratio. And I think um, case fatality ratio and infected fatality ratio are getting confused um, when they're calculated. And let me point this out. So, for, for example, we look at New York as the prime example of cases versus deaths. And if we actually break that number down, and I'll, I'll share an article so you can read through that, but our case fatality ratio is sitting more at 8% versus 0.2%. Um, and 0.2%, where did I get that number from? Well, 0.2% is what you typically see with the common flu that everybody's talked about. So if we're truly at 8% in New York, and versus 0.24, but 0.2% yeah, with the common flu, we are 40 times more deadly than your common flu. That's a huge number, and that's very concerning. Uh, for an IFR or an infection um, fatality ratio, we see 0.5%, which the common flu is 0.2%, which is still 25 times more deadly than your common flu. So both those numbers are much higher than the common flu. So we do need to be concerned about this when we're making those calculations. Of course, these variables do change depending on the population, depending on the death rate that's going on. And so if we calculated out what's going on in California with, you know, we had early lockdowns, my intuition is we have a, a strain that is strain A, versus what we have over on the East Coast and in Europe is strain B, which is a lot more deadlier strain. I think, yeah, we may be seeing a lower case fatality rate in the California, Oregon, Washington area. But over in the East Coast, what we're seeing is when all these people get sick, this number is a lot higher. And one of the more concerning things I talked about in some of my earlier videos is this clotting that's happening especially more and more and more this is being reported now that people at ages between 30 and 40 years old who may develop even mild symptoms where they have you know mild fatigue headache cough they're doing okay they're not going into the hospital doing this massive pneumonia thing and this respiratory arrest but what we are seeing is now they're noticing oh gosh why are all these young people coming in with strokes Remember, I talked about that uh, in the other video, how these viruses kick up all these cytokines and kick up all this inflammation that causes coagulation to increase. And I talked about some natural anticoagulants, and I also mentioned some 
pharmaceutical ones like heparin or one of the drugs orally is called Lovenox. So we need to consider these variables as all treatment options. Now, one more thing I want to jump into before I get into today's uh, natural agents that we're going to talk about. One, our president made a, a goof, which again, I see this all the time. Again, I'm not left, right, I'm up, down. Uh, I think that's the best analogy where I fall. He talked about injecting disinfectants into the body. Now, it, this can be taken in, in multiple ways. And yes, I agree, it, pro it was, should not have been mentioned in that manner. But there are truly natural disinfectants that we can use in the body if you interpreted it one way versus the other way. These natural disinfectants are things like hydrogen peroxide, which your body naturally produces when it's fighting something. We also talked about ozone in our earlier videos, which makes hydrogen peroxide. We also talked about vitamin C therapies, which can make hydrogen peroxide. So that would be one way we look at disinfectants. Now, it's not like sterilizing the blood, like I talked about in my ozone video. But what it is doing is it's helping your immune system regulate those cytokines and regulate the signaling pathways so they can get rid of those infectious agents quicker without as much harm. And speaking of vitamin C, I'm going to share with you an article that was just posted in uh, Pharma Nutrition evaluating the efficacy of intravenous vitamin C for the reduction of cytokine storm in the acute respiratory distress. And this was just published on the 21st of this month. And I want to share this because in conclusion, what they show is that during the severe episode that's heading towards pneumonia, vitamin C did show that it was improved. Bingo, right? So attacking closing clinics who are offering this therapy is complete bull crap. All right. Uh, we, we have research that it helps. It's not a cure. I get that. Nothing is out there that is a cure. So why are we attacking people when we're providing something that is helping? This is not a cure-all. Nothing out there is a cure-all for this. But we have now research suggesting that. So we need to back off attacking doctors if we have research to substantiate that or clinics that are doing that or proposing it. It should be part of our protocol. Again, not just drugs right? Because we don't have a good drug right now. So I'll let you read over that, but it, it basically spells it out. It's up on PubMed, which is a peer-reviewed database uh, as well. So one other one I'm going to talk about. Now, I have no research for it working with COVID-19, but I find it interesting, and it came to my mind of something to think about in the herbal family, it wouldn't be something that, you know, maybe I would take every day like elderberry, like we talked about in some other other videos. But if you were fighting something, coming down with something, it might be something to consider adding to your regimen. And this is Lomatium, uh, which is also called biscuit root, which Eastern Washington, we have tons of it. You dig it up and you can process it. Uh, but it's called Lomatium. And the reason I want to talk about Lomatium is because Lomatium was used Back in the 1917, 1918, uh, when we had the extensive Spanish flu wiping through. And one of the things that was observed was the one of the Indian tribes uh, near Carson City, Nevada, was taking a lot of this. And they noticed that they didn't have the severe, severe pneumonia that was going around the rest of the U.S. That's very interesting, right? When you have an herb that can prevent people from heading into pneumonia and death as rapidly as the rest of the country, especially with influenza in that sense. So lamatium or biscuit root was investigated, looked at, and it does in fact have antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial properties. Um, probably not studied as heavily as elderberry with the flu. We don't have a randomized trial with this. We just have basically history with its use and clinical applications with botanical medicines with this. One of the things that if you do get into biscuit root or lamatium, I like something called LDM 100. Um, it is really careful, really cautious. If you are using lamatium, sometimes people get a detox rash. Almost looks like um, you might be allergic to it, but you're really not allergic to it. So 
you can, you really want to work with either your herbalist or one of your doctors that understands this herb before you just go buy it and start taking it so you know what the difference is and you know how to dose it safely. But it's a really awesome herb to add to your to your regimen as well. So hope you guys liked today's content. Please, hey, share this content to people. I know it helps a lot of people out there. A lot of people uh, are valuing watching these videos. So please share this, uh, like it if it is on the YouTube channel because it will be up there. So please like that, share that, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hope you guys have a fantastic Monday. Look forward to talking to you on Wednesday. Probably going to talk about some essential oils and how that might be helpful in, in this system if something happens. All right, guys, have a good one.